Well, I split a bunch of wood today, so I'd have plenty. You know, I don't run the stove in here too much during the day because it stays pretty warm in here during the day. Like I said, you know, I don't mind temperatures around 40, 45 degrees inside this place. That's fine with me. That's, you know, summer weather to me, especially if I'm dressed right. So, time for me to fire the stove back up. What I wanted to do tonight was, uh, before I turn in for the night or it gets too dark out, which is going to get dark real soon, I wanted to make some hard tack. Hard tack was a food staple during the Civil War, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we make this hard tack. But the first thing I've got to do is get this stove fired back up. The good thing about greasewood is, you know, it ignites pretty fast. That's a real good fire starter um, in a camp situation or any situation like this. What I'll generally do is I'll just take a piece of this fatty wood and I'll cut a you know, little bit of a feather stick into it with my knife. You don't have to get too excited with that, especially if you're using a lighter. But I'll just cut down into it a little bit with my Pathfinder knife just to expose a few edges here, like this. That just gives it a good place to catch fire real easy. And it doesn't take much at all with this grease wood. You can see to light it on fire. Once you expose that oil. And I'll usually put a couple pieces in there just to get a good hot fire going. And then I'll put some thinner, smaller stuff in there to the side of that and start burning good. Get that stoking up real good and then I can put some bigger logs in there as well. And basically I'm just building a teepee in here just like I would in a fire pit. I'm just leaning those logs up against there. I think you can see that from where we're at. I'm just leaning everything up against that one larger log in TP fashion and building up around it and when it all catches fire good and starts to fall down and it's on fire then I'll add some bigger stuff in there okay guys so let's talk about this hard tack for a minute excuse the glasses but I've got some things that I'm kind of reading too some notes down here um, like I said hard tack was something that was a staple uh, food during the Civil War period and to go along with this 21st Century Long Hunter series, we talk about staple foods like pemmican we talked about, and we talked about different kinds of drop biscuits and ash cakes and things like that. And a young lady requested that I do a video on hardtack, so I thought I would go ahead and do that. I've never made it before, so I thought I'd go ahead and try that today. Um, Lieutenant Colonel C.L. Kilburn um, wrote in a note or a letter that was dated 1863 called Notes of Preparing Stores for the U.S. Army. And he gave a, a very detailed listing of what hardtack was supposed to be and how it was supposed to be stored and packed and how long it should last and how it should be made. Um, so I looked at the recipe that was on that website and what it says is four cups of flour and that should be the finest grain wheat flour that you can find. Uh, four tablespoons of salt, two cups of water, and that makes ten three by three half inch thick uh, pieces of hardtack. And hardtack, you'll see as we do this, is very similar to a cracker type device, but it's a little heavier and thicker than a cracker. But it's very similar to a cracker when it's done. Now, one thing that you have to do with hardtack is you have to kind of bake it, okay? So I had to figure out a way to make an oven within this yurt. And the way I'm going to do that is I've got two baking pans right here that I bought from a dollar store today. They're pretty good size. They're probably, I don't know, 10 by 12, something like that, 10 by 14. And I'm going to put them on top of each other just like this to create a kind of an oven. And I'm going to put that on top of the wood stove. First thing that we have to do is we have to kind of make this hard tack first. So let's get to that and then we'll get to the stove itself. Okay, one of the things that I've found to be real useful, you know, around camp or on a trail, anything like that, or even, you know, in this yurt when you are making food, is you need something to mix things in. And sometimes it's good if you just use these ziploc freezer bags these one quart freezer bags you can always wash them out and reuse them but they're real good for mixing different types of doughs and things in because you can close it up seal it mix it up and then get the dough right out of the bag instead of dirtying up a bunch of pots and pans to mess with it so what i'm going to try to do with this recipe is i'm going to try to cut it in fourths okay because i don't need this much hard tack so instead of using four cups of flour i'm going to use one cup and what i've got here is i've got some uh premium 100 percent whole wheat flour right here 
Dave Mitchell would be proud. Looks like it's pretty organic to me. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get one cup of this flour. So measuring devices aren't easy to come by, you know, unless you want to carry a whole bunch of measuring crap around with you. But I do have a pretty much eight ounce cup right here for one of my uh, bottles that actually fits this bottle right here. Okay, so with that, that gives me that pretty much eight ounces. So that would be one cup. So if I dip that down in here and fill it up. And just kind of level it off. That's going to give me my one cup of wheat flour. And that's what I'm going to put in this bag. Okay. So we'll start with that. And we'll get our flour bag closed back up and stowed back in our tub. So we've got it underneath the bed here. Now, the next thing it's calling for in this recipe is it's calling for four tablespoons of salt. Or four teaspoons of salt, excuse me. And again, I don't have a teaspoon, but I do have, you know my titanium spork and it's about a teaspoon so I'm going to use one teaspoon of salt. You know salt was something that was used and traded quite extensively along the frontier because they use it for so many things. Um, in this case I've just got a one pound container of Morton salt here and I'm just going to fill up this titanium spork with that and guesstimate that to be one teaspoon. Some of this stuff's going to be a little bit hit and miss guys because you got to Kind of do it as you go. Um, one thing I remembered from the recipe. When I read the colonel's letter, it stated that you should mix the salt with the water, not with the flour. I almost screwed that up, guys. So let me set this salt down for a second in this spoon. And we're going to have to have two cups of water. We want to cut that in fourths. So we're going to need a half a cup of water, basically. So let me get my container over here. That's probably partially frozen, but that's okay. And let's get a half a cup of water poured into our cup. Can't forget to stoke our stove here while we're at this, and we're not going to have an oven here in a minute. Let's take a look and see where we're at with that. Okay, it looks like we need a couple more pieces of wood in there real quick. Kind of leave that open for a minute to get some air in there. All right, so now I'm going to take my salt and I'm going to mix it directly into my water first, as suggested by the good colonel. Get that good and mixed together. And then I'm going to go ahead and put this solution into my mixing bag, just like this. Now, hopefully, if I've got my measurements pretty close to right, I should be able to seal this bag up, mush this all together, and I should have a dough or a batter when I'm done. Now, the way I read this um, in the letter, this stuff wasn't supposed to really be any more different consistency than any other kind of biscuit or batter that you're going to make. It's supposed to be fairly thick not runny, well mixed, but you should be able to roll it out with a rolling pin. Now, I don't have a rolling pin, so what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to use the back of one of these cake pans as a flat surface that we're going to use for our oven, and I'm going to use a round water bottle for a rolling pin. I'm going to improvise with the equipment that I have. You know, I could make a wooden rolling pin easy enough. I could go carve one out of a tree, but I've got a metal water bottle sitting here. Why not use it? I want to mix this up real good see how we're doing here. I'm going to let just a little bit of air out of this thing so that I can kind of knead this dough a little bit more in my hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze a little bit of the air out of it and then seal it back up. And that will allow me some room to maneuver to knead this together a little bit better. Like this. Yeah, that's good and thick. Pretty good. Pretty good. Now, according to this journal or this letter, this hard tack is supposed to be about um, a half an inch thick. So when I roll this out, I'm just going to put a ball of it on this cake pan on the back side and I'm going to roll it 
basically into about a half inch thick square and we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. So I've got my dough all kneaded together here. Let's kind of get it out of this bag and hopefully you know it won't stick to this bag too bad coming out because that's you know we don't want it to be sticky we want it to kind of be you know the consistency of a flour and I'd say there might be just a little bit too much water in that if I had to guess but I could be wrong we'll find out I'm gonna go ahead and get myself a rinse pail for my hands here put some water in this bucket Again, buckets are multi-purpose. You know, I'm going to use it now to rinse my hands off then as I'm doing this. So I'm going to take my water bottle here. I'm actually going to put a little bit of this flour on the top of this thing, just like your grandma used to do when she was making cakes. I'm also going to Put some of it on my would-be rolling pin here and start to roll this out. Now remember I don't want to get this thing any thinner than about a half an inch. And that's probably about a half an inch right there. Now typically I think these things were made in squares to tell you the truth but I don't think a round is going to make any difference we're going to cut it either way so it's not really going to matter a little bit more flour on my hands here flip this over in the flour a couple of times just get the edges neat I think we've got it about a half an inch thick right now now the other thing that I read in that letter on prepping hardtack was that you were supposed to punch holes in it and it specifically said with a nail or some other device um, so that it has the consistency of like a saltine cracker but you're not supposed to punch that hole all the way through so I'm just going to take and put a row of holes in here I'm not quite going to punch them all the way through just to where I can kind of feel the edge of the pan maybe with this nail that probably helps it cook through I would guess okay I'm gonna say that's pretty good to go okay now We've got our other pan here, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to take our dough, slide it off into this pan, just like this. We'll wipe this dough off into our wash bin. Making a little bit of a mess, but that's okay. Wipe anything off that's on the back is sticky real quick just to get that cleaned up fairly well. Then I'm going to put this right over the top of this one, and I'm putting this right on top of the wood stove, just like this. Now, what it said was that you should cook this for 15 minutes, and then you should flip it so it cooks total for 30 minutes. And I've got about a quarter after 5 right now, so at 5.30, we'll check it out and see what she looks like. Okay, guys, it's been about 15 minutes now. I really don't remember in my research whether it was 15 minutes per side, 30 minutes total, or 30 minutes per side for 60 minutes total. I also don't know what the temperature of this oven is. So this is kind of a guesstimation game, but I'll let you know in the end. It's been 15 minutes. I can feel heat radiating out of this thing pretty good. It feels pretty good and hard on the bottom. And what it said was that you want this thing to be brown on both sides. So I want to be careful not to break it when I'm flipping it here. I can. It looks like it's pretty brown on that side. 
I didn't quite flip it to the middle, <laughs> but that's okay. But underneath the flower, it looks like it's brown on this side. There was a couple edges that were a little bit doughy, but I think that 15 minutes is right. We'll put it for 15 minutes on this side, and we'll come back and check on it. Okay, guys, well, it's been 15 minutes now. On this other side, I'm going to pull this top off, see what we got. As long as we didn't burn the other side, we should be okay. Oh, nice. Pretty good. Okay, well, we got a cooling rack sitting over here. It's basically the rack that I took out of that oven that I didn't use in here. Pretty convinced about that. I think I'm going to put it on the cooling rack and see what we got. If nothing else, we know to cook it longer the next time, right? But it feels pretty good. All right, let's take it over here and see if I can move this camera over so you can see this cooling rack. Ah. i got to loosen something up here. That wasn't what I wanted to loosen. I think you can see that cooling rack. I'm going to have to turn the light up just a little bit for you. There we go. Okay. Here we go. Set this down on the cooling rack and let her cool down and see what we got. See if we got some good hard tack here. <laughs> 